message, we stepped away, but you may remember a couple weeks ago, we had started into a series, an uh, interim series here, as we've taken a break from Romans for a little bit, and we're working our way through the church covenant that the church recently adopted at our annual, our annual church business meeting. And so I printed off extra copies. Everybody had one, I think, at the time we adopted it, but in case you've lost yours or whatever, there are some additional ones that have been printed, and they are on the back table. I encourage you maybe after service to pick one up if you'd like it. Maybe stuff it in your Bible, and then it'll be here because it might be helpful for you as we work through some of the elements of it in these messages over the next few weeks to be able to follow along, if you'd like, and see exactly what it is. Not only are there the statements here, but there are uh, little end notes with scripture references that go along. And, and for the most part, I think, my, my plan at least, is to actually, when we preach through it, use those texts that are in the covenant as the basis. We may use some supplemental texts that go along with it, but primarily just to work our way through um, the covenant and make us aware of what it teaches and show us the biblical parameters of the reason why we would choose to do such a thing. In just a few moments as we get into the message, you'll understand why we're here. We're going to look at probably a familiar passage to many, but yet one that's very, very important uh, given what we'll, we'll see in the message this morning as it relates to our covenant membership here as a local church. So if you'd like to follow along with me in your Bibles, we're going to read the first eight verses of John chapter 3 where John records this in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I'll say in a moment, I was planning that this would be part of a, of a larger message that would deal with other things, but I kept the same title. Uh, it's really part of a three-word uh, title that would, would have been here, but it's not. I've just entitled this message, Birthed. Birthed. Well, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you thanking you for this opportunity that we have now to, in this worship service, Spend a few moments uh, looking at your word, a portion of it, and seeking to gain understanding from it. Uh, Lord, we're here obviously for a, a generalized purpose as a local church, as we're attempting to uh, set the groundwork and the framework for who we are as a church and what we should be committed to be and do for one another as a local church. But Lord, regardless of that, this is your word, it's your truth, and You've recorded it and left it here for us because you intend it to instruct us, to guide us, to benefit us, Lord. Uh, some of the things we'll talk about in our afternoon service today as we look at the special revelation of your word, Lord, that's what this passage is intended to be and do for us. And so we pray that that would be the case. Uh, instruct us, guide us, edify us, encourage us, strengthen us, convict us, whatever our need is this morning, Lord, may your word be sufficient uh, for our needs. And Lord, I know in so doing, as we respond to it, then Lord, you are glorified and honored. And that's our goal, Lord. We want you to be glorified and honored through this time of preaching. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I mentioned, two Sundays ago, we began our series on the church covenant. And if you were with us, uh, you hopefully can remember some of that. If you weren't, I will remind you that I began by trying to set the groundwork for the validity behind covenants in general, and then the benefit that we can derive as a local church from entering into covenant with one another as members of a local church. First, we saw that covenants are a biblical concept. We looked at several examples in the Old Testament where God himself chose to covenant together with several individuals. If I think back in my own mind, I think we looked at Noah, uh, Abraham, Moses, David, uh, and the nation of Israel as individuals or groups of people that God chose to enter into covenant with. 
Then we also, at the end of that section, looked at the pledge of a new covenant that was going to come, and we saw that that new covenant has been realized in the blood of Jesus Christ, and that all those who have received Christ as Savior then have been ushered into this new covenant with God. So we saw that covenants are a biblical concept. Secondly, we considered the reality of the church corporate, and we looked into the book of Ephesians particularly. We could have gone really to several places in Scripture, but they was, it was helpful for us because these could all be found in one of the epistles. And Paul, as he was writing to the Ephesian church, again, a local corporate body of believers, he used three different metaphors to describe who they were in relationship to Jesus Christ. And we talked about them briefly in the second part of that message. He said they were the body of Christ. The church had become the very body of Christ through their faith in Him, and as such, He had become the head of the church. They were the body. At the end of that glorious section we considered, He said that Jesus had become their fullness, but also we saw that they had become His fullness. This was God's intended purpose. Jesus didn't die in vain. His sacrifice on the cross of Calvary was for the very purpose of purchasing His bride, and He did so. And as such, those who again come to him by faith, we are now united with him and we come become part of his body. He's the head of the body. We are, we are his members, if you will, and we are together, amazing as that sounds, together we are more than we are individually. Uh, a beautiful concept, an amazing concept in many ways. Paul went on to use another metaphor. He described the church as the building of Christ. And he saw that, he stated that they were now builded together upon the foundation of the apostles with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And we, so we saw that as the individual members, in an, for example, a, a, the group of member of individual Christians within the church at Corinth, as these individuals came to saving faith in Jesus Christ, they were immediately added to this great edifice that God was building, this building of the Lord with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone of this building. The third metaphor that he used to describe the church was found in chapter 5, the bride of Christ. And we saw that the church was the bride for whom Jesus died. We saw that as we trust in Christ, we are betrothed to Jesus as our great bridegroom. And we said the analogy here is not as a bunch of individuals being betrothed to Christ. There's, it's not a polygamous marriage relationship that we're talking about here. It's a glorious monogamous relationship. Therefore, again, reminding us that when we get saved, we don't relate to Christ in this sense individually. We relate to him corporately. We are all the bride of Christ and not just our local church here at Abundant Life Baptist Church, not just the church in Ephesus that Paul was writing to, but the entire bride of Christ are related to him in this sense. And we looked at some of the beautiful things that Jesus said he was doing for his bride, and we saw some of the responsibilities that we have as the bride of Christ. Each of these three metaphors very graphically illustrated that the church is a collection of individuals related to Christ. While we must individually place faith in Jesus for salvation, we can't get saved in any other way than putting personal faith and dependence in Him as our Savior. Once we are saved, we become of this great, about part of this great collective of the redeemed, and as such, we are bound together as Christ's church. Thirdly, in that initial message, we looked at the testimony of the very first church that is recorded for us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, as, as Peter, under the inspiration and power of the Holy Spirit, begins to proclaim this great message there at, at Pentecost, as there's so many gathered to hear him speak there uh, in Jerusalem. 3,000 individuals, by the power of God and by His grace, are saved. And when this happens, we are given, just in a few verses, a succinct statement of what this meant for them, how it transformed their lives, how they became incredibly unified. We saw that the Bible testified that they all continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine, that they all fellowshiped together, the word koinonia, meaning they held all of these things in common. They all broke bread together. I said, I think probably we're led to understand that this is speaking of their observance of the Lord's Supper, but it could just mean also their, their willingness to come together and share, even in the, the idea of eating together, that fellowshipping together once again. And we saw that they all continued in prayers together. Beyond this, Luke went on to write that they shared all things. It was a unique situation. These people had, many of them, traveled from various regions as Jewish individuals to come back to Jerusalem in obedience to God to observe this Pentecost holiday. It was one of the three times where they were commanded by God to leave their homelands and travel to Jerusalem to worship the Lord together as a community. And as they came and as they got saved, it's obvious that their mindset was, where else can we go? 
Where else should we go? There wasn't any desire to go back home to where they had come from. No, they decided we're staying in Jerusalem. We're going to be a part of this new body forever. And we even get information that they were willing to sell properties and other things and take the proceeds that they derived from this and divide it among the entire body that everyone might be able to have their needs met and, and stay together. We saw that they were also, we were reminded in that, uh, that record that they continued to meet daily in the temple and also from house to house. We saw that they continued to have favor among all the group. In other words, isn't it beautiful that even at the outside, Luke is telling us these people had this relationship with one another. They continued in favor of one another. They didn't break up into little specific groups and cliques and said, well, you know, I, I like these part of the bride of Christ, but I'm not so keen about this part of the bride of Christ. No, they all were in favor one with another. And then we were told that God graciously continued to add to their number. So 3,000 wasn't the limit of what God was doing. He was continually, daily, to add people to his church. And so it has been throughout the last 2,000 years or so since that very time of the inception of the church. We saw as we considered that record in Acts that it's almost like this was something that came naturally to them. It was almost something that was instinctive to them now that they were saved. It was fundamental they could understand from who they were. I said it this way in the message. It was almost as if this group of people who are now saved could not envision living their lives apart from these, their fellow church members. I wonder, do we see it that way? <laughs> I don't ever want to be unkind. I, just, I do want to be fair, though. And I want to challenge us not just to look at these concepts and just allow them to blow off as if, oh yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, but it doesn't mean anything. It does mean something, or it should mean something. Can we envision our lives apart from the people of God? Is there any human being that you would rather spend your time with than the people of God? We were having this discussion in the car the other day. Is my family's kind of in transition with the death of my father, several years ago, now my mother here recently, we kind of settled her estate as, as children just the end of this week, and we were going somewhere as a family, and, and we were having this discussion in the car, and it was kind of like, Dad, are you going to keep in touch with your brothers and sisters? You know, you're not very good at this. You're kind of like, eh. you know, we need to keep up with family. And I said, well, I'm sure we'll keep together. But I said, my family, my blood family, isn't the most important thing in my life anymore. God's people are. Now, I'm, I'm fortunate, I don't mean to say this to, to make anyone feel bad, I'm fortunate, to my knowledge, every one of my brothers and sisters are Christians, so they're part of God's family too. But my relationship, my primary relationship is with you, the fellow building members, the fellow bride, the fellow body, the ones that God has brought us together as an assembly. I honestly believe this. I actually think this is what God intends. And it is almost like the new church there in Acts, that was their understanding. It's like, we're not going home to relatives and friends and family anymore. We're staying here. Now, if they want to join us, if they can agree to what we believe about Christ and they want to be a part of this, fine. I'm sure they were welcomed with open arms, but it was almost like, we're not going back to that life anymore. That's not our life. We have a new life in Christ, and we can't see it being lived any other way. So we began by seeing the church should be a covenant people, a group of Christians who covenant together as the unique people of God through their mutual relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now this Sunday, as we continue on in our series, we want to begin looking at our church covenant in earnest, the actual document that the church put together and adopted that would be these vows, if you will, these Testaments that we make one to another that we are going to voluntarily enter into and bind ourselves together as a local church. And so over the next few weeks, it's my goal to help us better understand the covenant elements and vows and hopefully encourage us by God's grace to fulfill them to his glory and to our benefit. Our church covenant consists of 10 paragraphs, all right? As I mentioned at the outset, I initially said... My goal was this, and it may still be my goal, but I failed the first week. My goal was one Sunday on a paragraph, one Sunday on a paragraph. So I was going to get this first paragraph into my message, and I'm like typing up, and I'm on the first point, and I look down at how many pages I've got, and this is not going to work. This is not going to work, so let's throw that idea aside. We'll just focus on this first one. So I know that the first paragraph is going to be more than one week, but maybe by God's grace, we can keep the others in there, but uh, no promises. All right. Anyway, our church covenant begins with these words. Let me read them for you. Um, 
It says this, Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, being made by God into a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and a people of God's own choosing, we do now joyfully affirm our covenant together. Right? That is the opening. And there's really three things there, I think, that we could focus on. The idea of being birthed, the concept of baptism is there that we'll deal with next week, and the idea I was going to call being bound together that comes up in the third part of that paragraph. But again, we're just going to focus on the first one this afternoon, and that's what takes us to our text, because in, the, in notes, that's the text that we reference. And there are others that we could look at, but this is certainly a classic text on what it means to be born again. So we read the verses at the outset. I won't read them again right now, but Jesus is in Jerusalem. This is early in his, in his ministry, okay? And he's in Jerusalem. He is actually observing the Passover feast. And as he is there, a man named Nicodemus, who we find out to be a Pharisee, comes and visits Jesus by night. We cannot know exactly why he came to Jesus by night. John doesn't inform us in, in his gospel as to reason why. But it would seem that it's fair for us to infer that he wanted to encounter Jesus in a more private nature. He wanted maybe some one-on-one -on -one time with this man. He wanted to get to speak to him when there weren't others around, and he could actually focus on Jesus and have some conversation with him. As he begins this interchange with Jesus, we find in, in uh, verse 2, he says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi. All right, And the word rabbi here is the idea of being a teacher or an instructor. In, in Judaism, there were these rabbis. They were those who were, who were knowledgeable in the law, knowledgeable in Old Testament truth, and it was their job to teach and instruct others in their faith. So Nicodemus is already understanding. I know enough about this man that he seems to be a faithful and qualified teacher of us, although we know in other places in the gospel we realize Jesus didn't receive any formal training as a rabbi. But obviously, being the Son of God, he was more aware of the truth of Israelite faith than anybody. But he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That's kind of interesting, really, if you stop and think about it, because what signs exactly was it that Nicodemus had in mind? The only miracle that John has recorded for us in his gospel prior to this interchange with Nicodemus is the wedding scene at Cana, where Jesus turned the water into wine. And most of us believe that that is the first miracle that Jesus actually performed. It's certainly the first one that is recorded for us in the Scriptures. I'm not saying Jesus didn't do other miraculous things. But it's the only one we can attest to is being recorded. So I wonder, was Nicodemus present in Cana? Did he personally witness this miracle at some point when he was there? Or had word made its way back to Jerusalem? Was Nicodemus originally from Jerusalem? Had the word come back to him about what had happened in Cana and he had heard of it this way? Again, we don't know. It's all hypothesis on our point. Prior to our event here in John chapter 3, the only other thing that John records is that Jesus, when he came to the temple, he drove out the money changers, turned over their tables, called them a den of thieves. He says, you've turned my father's house, which is supposed to be a house of prayer, into a den of thieves. So he had driven them out of the, out of the temple to cleanse it. He did that twice in his ministry, both at the beginning and at the end. I wonder, was this what Nicodemus was referring to? The incredible authority that Jesus had exhibited as he cleansed the temple that day? I don't know. I don't know if he would have called that a sign, but maybe he would have. But he does seem, I take Nicodemus' words here to see as being a very sincere man. And I think he was acknowledging, honestly, I would, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, acknowledging that he believed Jesus was actually a servant of God, sent by God to do amazing things. I think he acknowledges that in his opening statement. But I wonder how stunned he was after he you know, gives this gracious welcome to Jesus as he comes and meets him all night to have Jesus respond with these words in verse 3. Most assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Where does that come from? What does that have to do with anything that Nicodemus has said so far? Why would Jesus make this statement to this man who comes to visit him by night? 
Does Jesus say these words because he knows deep down in his heart and soul that this is what Nicodemus is truly seeking after? Is this what's going on in Nicodemus's heart, but Nicodemus doesn't even yet vocalize it, but Jesus is aware? That could be possible because Jesus, as God, did have the ability in his God nature to know all things. I think many times he purposely set that aside and operated more in the realm of, of the limitations of his humanity, but he certainly could have known what was going on in his mind, and maybe that's what Nicodemus was thinking. But again, John doesn't record in the text that that's what was happening. Does Jesus simply say these words to Nicodemus because he knows this is the truth that Nicodemus needs to understand? Whether Nicodemus understands it or not, I think that's probably more in line with what's happening based upon what happens later on in the interchange. We cannot know, but this we do know from Jesus' words. Immediately, Jesus has established something as factual that is going to temper everything that is said from this point forward. We know this fact. He makes it very clear. There will never be an individual who ever sees the kingdom of God without first being born again. That's what he says. No equivocation. No, well, this might be true of you, Nicodemus, but it isn't true of others. No, 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 no. He says no one will ever see the kingdom of God unless they are first born again. This is truth, we could say, that Jesus imparts to us in this text. How will Nicodemus respond? Well, we find it in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? From a human perspective, this is a very logical response and question. How can an old man, a grown man like Nicodemus, how can he climb back up into his mother's womb and be born again? Because isn't that what Jesus said? You have to be born again? How does that happen? And in light of our human understanding, it is a fair question. We shouldn't be too hard on Nicodemus. It's a fair question to ask. But it is one that helps us to understand, again, I think, a fundamental truth that we need to always keep in mind. Nicodemus was spiritually blind. He didn't understand certain things. In fact, I think we'll see as this unfolds, this is the very reason why Nicodemus needs to be born again. He's going to have to be born again because he doesn't even understand what the new birth is. He is somehow unable to understand these spiritual realities that Jesus just speaks so emphatically and point blankly to him here this night. So Nicodemus asks a question, logical in the human sense, how can I be born again? How can I get back into my mother's body and come out again? How is this possible, Jesus? How will Jesus respond to that? Well, we find it in verses 5 through 8. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What is Jesus informing us of through these words? It's this. Nicodemus has misunderstood Jesus has spoken truth, but Nicodemus, as of yet, does not understand the truth. Jesus is not speaking of physical rebirth. He goes on to inform Nicodemus and the rest of us. He's obviously speaking of a spiritual rebirth. Now, verse 5, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, has been interpreted differently by Christians throughout the years. I'm not going to give all the reasons or all of the responses, and I'm not going to debate because I don't think it's really necessary one way or the other. I tend to look at it when he says of being born of water and of the Spirit as Jesus is actually talking about the two types of birth, physical and spiritual. And if that's what he is saying here, then to be born of water is another way of saying to be born physically. The child developing within and then being delivered from his mother's womb. So this would go back to what Nicodemus originally had said. He said, how do I get back into my mother's womb? How is this possible? And Jesus says, no, you misunderstand. There is a birth of water. Perhaps that's what he means by this text. And he's saying that would be your physical birth. But there's another birth, Nicodemus, you need to understand. And that's the one I'm talking about. It's to be born of the Spirit is a spiritual birth. To be brought to life, we'll find out, by the Holy Spirit of God. But why should an individual need to be made spiritually alive by the Holy Spirit of God? Well, it's inferred here, and we find it fleshed out in other places of Scripture, but it's because people like Nicodemus, people like you and people like me, are spiritually dead. 
And we're spiritually dead, we know from the scriptures, because of Adam. That's why we're spiritually dead. Keep your finger here in John 3. Let's go over to uh, Romans 5, and let's read some passages. We studied it not all that long ago in our Roman study, but they are the key text. But they're not the only text, but a key text that inform us of this reality. As Paul is building his teaching, his treatise on the gospel and the necessity of it, and he's been framing out the, the necessity of man to be saved because of his inerrant sinfulness, he, Paul informed us of where we are and why we are in the position we are as it relates to our sin in chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. He goes on to say more, but that's sufficient for us this morning. Verse 12, therefore, just as through one man, and we find out in the context he's speaking of Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Now, when we studied this, not all that long ago in our rumored study, we understood that because we are all the offspring of Adam, we have all died in Adam's sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they suffered what God had deemed would be the consequences of their sin, death. Because Adam was the federal head of all of humanity. When Adam died, all of his offspring, which is all of us, died in him. Thus, Paul says, even those who didn't commit the same transgression as Adam, in other words, one, they didn't transgress because he, he clearly says there was no law from the point of Adam till the time of Moses when God delivered the law, so there was really no written law for them to transgress anyway. And the rest of them had not been given this, the one law that Adam had received in the garden to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because that wasn't even an option. They got taken out of the garden, and they didn't have access to it anymore. So that wasn't even thing that forbid him. So Paul is saying none of these people sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. None of them did the same thing Adam did, yet he says they're all sinners. And we know they're all sinners because they all die. Death is universal to all mankind. Why? Because man is universally a sinner. And the wages of sin, clearly the Bible teaches us, is death. So the federal headship of Adam has passed this sentence of death to all of his offspring, of which we are one. Since this is true, Jesus informs Nicodemus, then there is a requirement of the Spirit's rebirth of these individuals because presently they are dead in sin. Unless Nicodemus is born again, Jesus says, he cannot see or enter into the kingdom of God. And friends, he said this to one individual, but the truth is universal. Apart from this spirit's rebirth, neither you or I will ever see or enter into the kingdom of God. It is an impossibility. So since this is true, Jesus informs Nicodemus, he requires the Spirit's rebirth because he is presently dead in sin. Unless Nicodemus is born again, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. But some might say, hmm, that seems kind of silly to me. What's Jesus saying here? Nicodemus wasn't dead. And if we take the, the, the statement of Jesus and apply it to our lives, we might sit here and say, wait a minute, I'm not dead? I don't know if Nicodemus was standing or sitting at this time of his conversation with Jesus, but he's there in physical form. He's alive. He's talking. He was able to walk to get there. He's interacting with Jesus. How is it that we could say that he is dead? But again, this is unfortunately a misunderstanding on our part of what it really means. Jesus is not speaking of physical death here in this particular statement. He's speaking of spiritual death. If you don't know this, the Bible informs us that being human is more than physical. Being human is more than this body in which we live. In fact, while the body is important, the body is not necessary for man's existence. When God created Adam in the Garden of Eden, he formed him in bodily form, we are informed, from the dust of the earth. So God himself actually reached down, apparently... This must have been the work of Jesus Christ in, in a, in a human-type form. Reached down and of the dirt of the ground actually formed and shaped the body which would be Adam. And I guess we can assume, I think we should assume, that this body of Adam was there on the ground, looked like Adam, 
felt like Adam, would become Adam. But it's interesting, in the Genesis account, we find this. All he was was a lifeless body until God then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then we are informed in the book of Genesis that he became a living soul. From that, we can derive that the life of man is independent from his bodily form. Beyond this, though, there is a sense in which one can actually be alive physically, organically, his heart beating, his lungs breathing, his brain functioning, his body mobile, and yet he can be dead, according to the Scriptures. Dead spiritually. When Adam and Eve sinned by disobeying God, they suffered the consequences of sin immediately, which the consequences of sin was death. But just a few verses later, we see Adam and Eve walking in the garden. They're, they're making fig leaf coverings. They're conversing with God the Father when he comes to meet them in the cool of the day. What do you mean they're dead? Well, the Bible clearly describes them as being dead because they had eaten of the forbidden fruit and the wages of sin was death. So this spiritual death is something different than physical death. This spiritual death means that they were now separated by their sin from the giver of life, which is God. They were no longer able to relate to God in a spiritual way. They were no longer able to share the totality of their image-bearer status that had been given unto them in the very creation by God. And the reason they couldn't hold this anymore is because now they were sinners. They were now unrighteous before God. Adam and Eve were still breathing, they were still functioning, they were still able to perform physical tasks, but according to the scriptures, they were dead, spiritually dead. They were cut off from the life of God by their sin. So as Nicodemus stands before Jesus this night, he also is one who is dead in sin. He's functioning physically, he's functioning mentally, and don't lose sight of this, he's actually functioning on a religious level. <laughs> He's a Pharisee. Yet Jesus informs this man that he is spiritually dead. He was not, nor could he be, rightly related to God in his present condition. He was dead in his sin, and he was cut off from the life of God. But it would appear that being dead in trespasses and sins also made it impossible for Nicodemus to understand spiritual truth. When Jesus tells Nicodemus of his need to be born again, Nicodemus responds by saying what in verse 9? Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? <laughs> How is this possible? How can things actually happen, Jesus, as you are presently describing them to us? And you know what's interesting, and I think it's informative for us, what does Jesus go on and say to Nicodemus in verse 10? Jesus answered and said to him, what does he say to him? Are you a teacher of Israel? And you don't know these things? Jesus points out to Nicodemus just how serious this condition of spiritual death actually is. Can we use modern terminology for our purposes this morning? Nicodemus is a trained theologian. His life has been devoted to understanding God, His law, His purposes, His way. He's a Pharisee. Pharisees were those men, a, a certain sect of people who gave their lives completely over to this particular pursuit of understanding God's Word and living it. His life has been apparently one of being a teacher, because Jesus says, aren't you a teacher of Israel? So obviously he was serving in the role of a rabbi as well. He had been teaching the very Word of God to the chosen nation of God, the nation of Israel. And yet, all of this being true, Nicodemus is completely oblivious to his present spiritual separation from God. And he is completely unknowledgeable of the necessity of his receiving new birth from the Holy Spirit if he would ever be rightly related to God and ever be allowed to enter into his kingdom. How is this possible? If anybody should understand these truths, it should have been this man. 
but he obviously doesn't. Why doesn't he? The text informs us. He's dead. He is spiritually dead. And Nicodemus' situation is instructed for us because it reminds us that one can even be religious. One can even be spiritually devoted, yet one can be completely lost and undone in their sin. And it's not just that one can be, friends. It's that everyone is. This is not just Nicodemus' poor situation. Boy, you know, everybody else gets it, Nicodemus. But what happened to you? Were you dropped on your head when you were born? What, you can't understand these things? No. Jesus is graciously revealing to Nicodemus and us all through this recording of it in Scripture what our problem is. We don't get it. I'll be stronger and say, I think the Scripture is telling us we can't get it in our present condition. Why? I'm dead. I don't understand these spiritual things. Oh, I, I can understand there is a spirit realm. I can even be fascinated by it. I can even be involved in it. I can even pursue it. But according to this situation, like Nicodemus, he can't conceptualize it in its totality and in the reality of what it really means for him. He doesn't understand even the most basic of things, apparently, that Jesus is trying to tell him why. Because he's dead. He's dead in his trespasses and sins. Well, he needs new birth. How does this new birth happen? Well, Jesus, I think, tells us in verse 8. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So, Jesus says, is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus informs us that the Holy Spirit's rebirthing is very similar, he says. This maybe, he says, will help you, Nicodemus. I'm going to talk to you in an illustrative way to help you understand what I'm talking about, to conceptualize it. He says, being born of the Spirit is very much like what we observe in the physical world with respect to the wind. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because the Greek term and the Hebrew term that's often translated to be the Holy Spirit is what? Breath. Wind. <laughs> maybe this isn't by surprise that Jesus would pick this as an analogy. But Jesus says, the wind, Nicodemus, blows where it wants. Maybe we could say it this way. The wind blows of its own accord. He's also in this word picturing, say, in, in telling us that the wind blows invisibly, if you will, to the eyes of mortal men. He does point out what is obvious. We could say this if we were in this discussion and Jesus himself didn't bring it up. We might say, but wait a minute, Jesus, you're forgetting something here. We can hear the wind. And Jesus acknowledges that. And we can see the impact of the wind. We can't see the wind, but we can see the impact of the wind on the physical realm around it. But Jesus does inform Nicodemus and us of this truth. You cannot tell, Jesus says, where that wind's coming from. And you cannot tell where that wind is going to go. But I would ask us, does the physical wind really move of its own accord? Or is even our physical wind moved by a greater force than itself? The will of God. The ruler of the wind. Yes, I think we must acknowledge that even the wind must obey the directives of the Creator. Jesus is on a boat. <laughs> He's resting and sleeping. His disciples are there. They're crossing over the sea. One of these great tempests comes up. The, the boat is getting tossed about. Everybody's going to die. Where's Jesus? He's asleep in the back. Jesus, Jesus, save us. And Jesus stands up and says what? Be still. And immediately the wind stops. And everything settles down. And they're all like, even the winds obey his voice. Well, of course they do. He's the creator of the wind. The wind is his. The nature's not out here doing its own thing. The nature is here doing the will of the creator. So yes, we in our limited concept look at the wind blowing even among us on our earth and we say, well, I guess it's just kind of going wherever it needs to go, wherever nature takes it. 
I would think the scriptures would help us to see, no, that's not really the case. Somewhere behind all of this is a great director, and that's God, the creator of the wind, and he's moving it in the fashion in which he desires. Jesus, I think, is telling us, helping Nicodemus and us to understand that this is the exact same way that the Holy Spirit works in new birth. And if that's the case, then what are we to derive from Jesus' words? Well, the Spirit of God blows where it wishes. You're not going to be able to tell, humanly speaking, where the Spirit's going to come from in relationship to new birth, nor are we going to be able to tell where the Holy Spirit will go next after it is moved upon a certain individual. But this from Jesus' teaching, we can be assured. When the Holy Spirit brings new birth, the working, the evidence of his being at work will be undeniable. Hey, I may not know what the wind is, I may not know where it's coming from, and I may not know where it's going, but I tell you this, when you're in a windstorm, you get it. We all know this, the wind was here. <laughs> I see the impact of the wind Jesus is saying that's the same way when the Spirit moves. You don't know where the Spirit's going to come from. You don't know where the Spirit's going to go. But I'll tell you this, when the Spirit comes, you know it. You, ex you see, you experience the evidence that the Spirit has been here. Something changes when the Spirit of God moves in this way upon an individual is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. Now, here's the often debated question. When does this happen? Or maybe we could say it this way. What is the sequence of this happening? And I just want to be fair up front. Great Christians, godly Christians, good godly theologians have debated this for centuries because, again, there's not any one passage of Scripture that so definitively states it that we can say for sure this is the way it works. We don't know exactly the timing of the new birth that's described here. Does the new birth precede an individual's faith? That's possible. Does the new birth come simultaneously with someone's faith in Jesus? That's possible. Or does the new birth come as the result of someone having placed faith in Jesus? So obviously I think we would all have to say it's very closely related, but is it something that comes as an effect, if you will? Somebody has faith, now new birth comes. Is that what the text is saying here? Again, godly people are going to hold different varying positions on this. I'm just going to share with you what I see in the text as the way I think. I think Jesus seems to be implying in his story, in his illustration, that new birth from the Holy Spirit precedes faith. I see Jesus as saying that the Holy Spirit's new birth is what is actually necessary to make an individual capable of understanding spiritual truth, to understand their need for Christ, and then this working of the Spirit also enlivens the individual so as to be able to place their faith in Jesus. I believe this is why we find this interchange happening prior to the amazing teaching of John chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Jesus is given an illustration about the, the people in Israel as they were dying by being knit and beat, uh, bitten by the snakes, the poisonous snakes, and how God in their salvation, you know, had Moses craft this serpent image and hold it up. In verse 14, and it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is clear here. In these passages, that salvation comes from our faith in Jesus Christ. But I wonder, does the way in which the, the unfolding of these events, does it help us to understand that perhaps Jesus is saying, and I, I'm not saying you have to believe this, I'm just saying that's the way I kind of interpret it, that he is saying this, this, this working of the Spirit has to proceed and make you able now to put faith in Jesus Christ. That's the way I say it, but again, it could go different ways, and good people hold to it in different ways. The main theme, though, here of what Jesus is stating is the basis for where our covenant starts. That's why we read in our covenant, having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and then goes on to say, and based upon our profession of faith in Him. No individual, we learn most importantly from the Scriptures, but our Covenant is trying to inform us of this reality as well. No individual can be a Christian 
And thus no individual could actually be a member of the covenant community of Christ apart from the new birth of Jesus Christ as he has described it here to Nicodemus. As Jesus said to him, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The new birth, friends, is not a desirable but unnecessary element of Christianity. It is the very essence of it. Apart from the new birth of the Holy Spirit of God, no one can be a Christian. And thus, no one can be a part of the covenant community of Christ. So anyone who would join or seek to join Abundant Life Baptist Church is going to need to have to sign off on this declaration. They're going to need to have to affirm that this is true concerning me. Now, we, none of us can see into their hearts. I do think sometimes we can see the evidences of whether this is true or not. But they are going to have to affirm to us that, you know what, this has happened to me. The Spirit of God has moved upon me. And He has brought to me new life. And because of this, or in conjunction with this, or as a result of this, I have placed my personal faith and dependence in the finished work of Jesus cross upon, Christ upon the cross of Calvary. I am a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Friends, that's what it is to be a Christian. There is no other Christianity. There is no other way to be a part of the kingdom of God. This is mandatory for all people. It's very instructive for us as well, because there's been people throughout history that have sometime intimated, well, people in the Old Testament got saved some way, and the people in the New Testament got saved a different way. Ah, what, where, where do you get that? Jesus said nobody sees or enters the kingdom apart from being born again. So anybody who's ever been saved throughout all of history or ever will be saved throughout history, is all, they're all going to be saved the same way. They're going to be born again. The Spirit of God is going to move upon them and bring them new birth, and they are going to put their faith and dependence in the promises of God of a Redeemer, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. I really do think it matters little, the sequence of the events concerning the new birth, but we must believe in its necessity. And we must, if we would be a covenant member of the church of Jesus Christ, be truly born again. So as we bring this message to a conclusion and have just touched on the very first statement of our church covenant, that's be the question all of us would have to ask. Have you been born again? So what, what does that matter, Pastor? I'm already a member of your church. My name's already on the roll. I'm all set. Oh, friends, having your name on the... Church role of Abundant Life Baptist Church isn't going to get you into the kingdom of God one day. The only thing that's going to get you into the kingdom of God one day is being born again. So I wouldn't take much stock in being on our church's role in the sense of being able to be acceptable in the sight of Jesus Christ one day. I would ask yourself to sincerely inquire within, have I been born again? Can I see that God has opened my eyes and helped me to see that I am a sinner condemned and unclean and that my only hope is to put my faith and dependence in the one who died on the cross of Calvary for me? And have I done it? Am I trusting in him? Is my only hope of ever entering into those pearly gates one day the fact that I am trusting and depending in Jesus alone for my salvation? That is the only way one can be saved. And that is evidence of being a born-again Christian. So members of Abundant Life Baptist Church, you must be born again. People who have attended our services and maybe at some point would say, I would like to enter into covenant faithfulness with this body of church, a body of believers, I would say to you, you must be born again. Marvel not that we say unto you, you must be born again. Father, I pray that you challenge us this morning with these thoughts. I pray that the reality of what Jesus describes as a necessity here would be something we clearly understand. I pray that each person here can understand it because of the evidence of what Jesus has talked about. The Spirit of God has been at work. He's opened our eyes that were previously blinded. He has given understanding to where we were previously darkened. He has put us in a place where we can actually read what the Scriptures teach us about the, Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for our sin, and, and we have faith to believe it. 
It's not just some myth or some fairy tale. We believe this is truth, and we are willing to risk our eternal destinies upon this truth. We are depending upon our faith in this for our salvation. All of these things, Father, will be testimonies of the fact that truly new birth has occurred. Father, I pray each person in this room has been born again. But if there's someone or several someones here this morning who have not, Lord, my prayer for them is that today they would be born again. Be today that your spirit would be so at work in their lives that they would understand their need for Christ and that they would put their faith and their dependence in him before it is too late. Father, may it be so for your glory and for their benefit. We ask this in Jesus' name.